Thanks for the Macula Society asking me to give this overview today. I'm Pete Coffey. I'm based at UCL Institute of Ophthalmology, which is the postgraduate medical college associated with its specialist hospital, which is Moorfields Eye Hospital. What I'm going to take you through today is the London Project to Cure Blindness attempt of bringing a stem cell therapy to the clinic but also to give you the overview of other groups who are attempting this as well. So first of all, I just want to give you a bit of background around age-related macular degeneration and our attempts at a therapy for uh, that disease. But essentially, why do we think a stem cell therapy would be appropriate for this, this disease? and then give you the background to a number of other trials which are ongoing globally, and also to give you some follow-up information and data from our own project here in London, uh, which has been going five plus years now. Let me take you through to the um, issues and problems associated with age-related macular degeneration, the problem, what is happening in the eye during the onset of this disease. So the beauty of the eye is it has that window on the front, which unlike any other organ in the body, allows us to look into and in detail describe what is happening in the eye at any moment in time. So the red eye reflection that you get back when you start to put light into the eye, which most photographers really hate, is very dear to our hearts because that's a reflection of the back of the eye and specifically what we call the retina. The retina contains all the light sensitive cells which process light and allow vision. But in particular, geographically, there's an area which is about 10 millimeters in diameter, which is associated with what we call sight. This area deals with high visual acuity, basically the ability to read, drive, recognize faces, etc. And an even smaller area where the outside world is totally focused on, which is an area known as the fovea, which is about a millimeter. So this area is essential for us to be able to uh, C, this is the area which basically, if in any way is affected by disease or trauma, anything which disrupts that process will be detected by our cells. We ourselves will start to see these anomalies in which it's affecting our sight. Now, that only accounts for about 10% of the rest of the whole of that retina. The whole of the retina, again, is involved in vision, but mainly night vision, so quite crude vision. And also it's involved with bringing the world into that area around the macula. So that picture doesn't really do justice to what we would say is the underlying biology. There are three layers in that picture. There's the top layer, which, as I said, contains all those light sensitive cells. So the cells which can detect light, whether it be color vision, etc. There's then a second layer directly underneath known as the RPE, which is it's a long uh, name. It stands for retinal pigment epithelium. And this layer doesn't contain light sensitive cells, but is essential to the good health of that top layer. It acts as a barrier to the rest of the outside world, but essentially it also maintains the good health of that top layer, the retina, by giving it nutrients and getting rid of debris. And then immediately behind that middle layer is a massive blood supply called the coroid. So that middle layer is essential to good, healthy vision. And the reason I'm focusing your attention is on that middle layer, because that is the layer in which the onset 
of the disease, age-related macular degeneration occurs. So typically what occurs in people over the age of 65, 70 is for reasons which we still don't understand is that middle layer, that RPE layer starts to break down and deteriorate. There's a number of uh, potential reasons why that occurs. Aging in its own right, which is the biggest factor of this disease. So those cells are changing over age. They're no longer able to deal with the stress, to deal with having to uh, maintain that barrier. Okay. One component of the disease, age-related macular degeneration, is a form which is called wet. Wet, age-related age macular degeneration, as it suggests, involves fluid and it's blood. And what happens is that middle layer, the RPE barrier, breaks down and the blood supply that's at the back, that choroid, starts to push leaky vessels through such that you get blood deposited between the middle and the top layer. So this is one form of age-related macular degeneration. And it's due to that breakdown in that barrier, that RPE, that middle layer, such that the choroid now pushes vessels through and starts bleeds. The other component is the dry form. And typically this takes a lot longer, but results in not just the breakdown of the middle layer, but also results in what can be seen in some of the trials in which they've entered the dry form of uh, the disease. You also see deterioration and degeneration and death in that top layer. So the light sensitive cells die the RPE barrier is broken and the choroid starts to die as well. So a much more complex, involved uh, disease, three layers affected, not just one. The top layer is affected, the middle layer is affected and the blood supply at the back is affected. And the reason I stress this will become clear uh, later on in the uh, discussion. So why did we in any way think that we could in some way replace that middle layer? And it came from two surgical um, therapies that were trialed at Moorfields and also in a couple of other centers globally. But they were two surgical procedures. One was where you literally lift the top layer and move it away from the diseased RPE, from the middle layer. And it's called macular translocation. It's a very complex operation. It takes three hours. And there are numerous other um, surgeries which the patients have to go through because you have to counter rotate the eye. But what it showed was if you can take the neural retina away from the diseased RPE, put it back on, good healthy RPE, you can maintain and improve someone's sight. The second was where you take RPE from outside that macular region. So you actually remove it from the patient's eye and translocate it, put it into the macular region. And again, what this showed was if you can put good RPE back, then you can actually maintain and potentially improve a person's sight. But again, the problem with both these procedures was that were they, they were complicated and involved further operations after the initial. So as a standard therapy, this would be very difficult to introduce to the NHS. There are long surgical operations with multiple procedures. What we want to do is simplify this. So can we actually already make RPE, not use the patient's own cells? And can we actually implant them into a patient in a operation which would take less than an hour? And that was the sole purpose of the London project, was to make 
the RPE, the middle layer. And there were two ways of achieving this. At the time the London project started, which was back in 2007, stem cells were only just being used as a potential source for therapies. Could we change and make a stem cell into an eye cell? So one of the first indications that we could do that came from the use of human embryonic stem cells. And in London, we could actually turn those stem cells into that middle layer, into that RPE layer. Um, one general misconception is stem cells, you just put them into a body and they know what to turn into. That is not true. A stem cell will not turn into a cell just because you actually place it into the body. In fact, what could happen there is that it turns into a tumor. So what we do is we actually turn the stem cell using what we know in terms of developmental biology into the eye cell that we want, which is RPE. Then back in 2004, and later was this new way of making stem cells, which was from a person themselves. You can take a piece of skin and you can turn back time in that skin cell. You can turn it back into a stem cell. And then from there, you can turn it into any other stem cell, or that was the hope, turn it into any other cell in the body. And again, We've managed to achieve this in London, where you take a person's skin cell, turn it back in time into a stem cell, and then turn it into RPE. So on the left here, you can see two characteristics of RPE. And the first is they have this black color, they're black. So that is the black pupil that you see in a person's eye. Again, it's the reflection of these cells. And the other is this crazy pavementing pattern. Cobblestone is what we call it, morphology. And on the right is what you can get from stem cells which have been turned into RPE. You can see these cobblestones and you can see this pigmentation. So we have ways now of making that middle layer, that barrier of cells, the RPE, from either human embryonic or what's called induced pluripotent cells states taken from the patient themselves. So in London, what we wanted to do was form that carpet of cells. So there are two methods in which people have tried these therapies in patients. The first is just to inject RPE cells into the middle layer. And the second is to create these patches, these bandages of RPE and place them into the back of the eye. Whether it be a injection of cells or a placement of these patch, it does involve a surgical procedure. It's easier just to inject cells than it is the patch. However, the reason the London uh, project used the patch is we believe this is an essential way of reforming the exact architecture of those cells as they were from the onset. Whereas just injecting cells themselves may not form that full carpet. So there are distinction, the differences between the groups uh, based on what we are trying to attempt in recapitulating that architecture at the back of the eye. So this is just a surgical tool, which we also had to uh, manufacture and make, which was to introduce those patches of cells. So it's a surgical tool in which it protects the patch while we introduce it into the eye. And this is just a cartoon to show you the surgery. There are three incisions made in the eye. One is to introduce a light source so we can see into the eye. One 
is to create um, a pocket so we can keep fluid going into the eye to make sure it's inflated. And the second, or the third, sorry, is to introduce surgical tools and the patches. The operation generally for both of them is very similar. So a detachment of the top layer is made by using fluid. So you detach the retina. You then make an incision in the retina and you either then inject cells or you post the patch. You then use a gas and air or oil to reattach the uh, top layer, the retina, back onto that patch of RPE. Here in this slide, I just want to go over the three most relevant at this point um, trials which have tried this approach for wet age-related macular degeneration. So um, the first of those that I've been talking about is the London Project to Cure Blindness. And in that therapy, human embryonic stem cells were made uh, were used to make RPE and a patch of cells. The patients that were treated had these very severe bleeds in the macular region between uh, the neural retina and the RPE. Um, two patients were treated back in 2018 and two patients have just been uh, retreated, have uh, been treated in 2021, 2022, and we're continuing to uh, uh, on that trial. Um, the second one was a academic group in China, again, using human uh, embryonic stem cells to turn them into RPE, but we're just injecting uh, cells. There was no patch involved. And again, these were severe bleeds um, in those patients. And the third one I'm mentioning is the Helios group in Japan uh, with Maseo Takahashi. And this was using the IPS technology where you take a person's a sample of a person's skin, you turn it into a stem cell, and then you turn it into RPE. And... Um, the group in Japan were um, treating a very complex cases of wet AMD, which is typically seen in Japan, which is called polyclonal choroidal vasculopathy or PCV. But it is a variant of wet AMD, which is uh, very apparent in, um, in Japan. Importantly, just to mention on these three trials is what was the visual outcome? And in the London uh, outcome, there was a three, a three line improvement in visual recovery or more than a three line improvement. There was 25 letters and there are five letters per uh, line in the test used in clinical trials. So that's, um, you know, a five, a five line improvement. That was quite a considerable improvement in what were two severe cases. And I'll come back to these um, following these slides to show you the follow up over five years. But what was seen in those two initial cases basically was an improvement in vision. In the uh, uh, China, um, experience, there was an improvement of 17 letters in um, one of the patients. And in two of the patients, there was ma maintain maintenance at the level that they came in. In the Japan IPS trial, there was an, an improvement in vision, but there was stabilization. So the AMD trials using the wet patients showed 
significant improvement in a number of the patients, but importantly, they were deemed safe in terms of the procedures. In terms of the dry form, there have been three standout trials which have examined the use of stem cells to replace that middle RPE layer. And one of the problems here in these trials is they've gone into end stage, which I'll come back to in a minute. But effectively, there's the California group, which is regenerative patch technology based at uh, the University of Southern California. And again, they were using embryonic derived, stem cell derived RPE. And this was in, like say, advanced late stage geographic um, atrophy. And in their results, they only saw three letter improvement. They weren't even getting one line of improvement. Um, they were getting um, stabilization, but in half the patients and in the further patients they've done recently, they still see a continuing decline. Then the very earliest trial, which was uh, again done in Los Angeles um, by um, a company at the time, which was called ACT, which was um, subsequently uh, taken up by Astellas, was again using human embryonic stem cells, but using a suspension. And in their group, they were actually seeing um, a supposed three-line improvement in nearly 50% of the patients. Although there has been some issues around exactly what that improvement is. And then just recently, the Israel group, again using cell suspensions of embryonic derived RPE, have reported their findings in which um, sadly there wasn't a way of looking at um, um, uh, visual acuity, but at least in over nearly 60% of their patients that were getting stabilization. But again, 25% of the patients were still seeing a continual decline. Why am I stressing the wet end stage? The reason I'm stressing it is the stem cell approach has been to replace the middle layer, the RPE, to use stem cell derived RPE to replace that middle layer of cells. The problem in end stage dry AMD, as I said, is there's also death in the top layer, in the retina, and death in the vasculature, the choroid at the back. So just replacing the RPE will not restore the neural retina, nor will it restore the blood supply. So therefore, in many ways, you wouldn't expect to see a major improvement in vision, but you may actually just get stabilization, which is effectively what the lineage group in Israel are saying. And in fact, they've now turned to trying to improve the stabilization to stop the progression of the disease rather than try, trying to actually improve it. So stop the progression. And um, they have just uh, formed a collaboration with Novartis to extend that work. So in total, one of the problems as well is with these various groups, what is being examined and can we make a comparison? And in many ways we can't because they are looking at different clinical groups, albeit within a particular group, you can make those um, comparisons. So in London, we're looking at wet. In uh, California and Los Angeles, they're looking at dry, as was in, in Israel. So there are de definitely different clinical populations at different times of the disease process. But just to mention before going on to the long-term data 
that um, we have uh, examined today or will examine today. There are two other trials which I've not uh, given uh, any um, output on because there's no publications as yet. But there is the National uh, Institute of Health with the National Eye Institute in Bethesda in which they are using IPS-derived RPE. That trial was meant to have started before the pandemic, but unfortunately it was closed down as a result of the pandemic and is only now starting to recruit again. And there's a trial in France, which has been uh, run by uh, uh, Montel, who's looking at the use of embryonic-derived RPE for the treatment of rare genetic diseases of the RPE, um, LRAT and MER-TK. And they've treated four patients and are following them now in terms of looking at efficacy. So finally, I just want to give you an update of where we are with the patients who were treated in the London project. So these were severe bleeds in which a patch of stem cell derived RPE was placed into their eye. So it was to replace the dysfunctional RPE. In these patients, there was a bad severe bleed, but the neural retina was still intact and the vascular supply was intact. So we actually use these charts, which um, give five letters per line. And what we're trying to see is what improvement we get in those lines. So the first patient when they came in and six months late, sorry, first patient when they came in could only read um, about two lines. Um, ideally, we were looking for a three line improvement. And what we got at six months was the six line improvement. In the second patient, barely one line was what the patient could see. Again, we were trying to get a three line improvement and we got a five line improvement with the second patient. What I want to do now is just give you the longitudinal effect. So at two years, we are still seeing these patients with a three line improvement. And on the right, what was even more impressive was they were going from, in the first patient, a word and a half in terms of their ability to read the number of words in a book, at one and a half, they were reading at nearly 70 words a minute. And in the second patient, you couldn't actually see the book and was now reading 50 words a minute. So this is the five year data in which we do see a decline after two years in the first patient, such that they're now longer reading three lines and above. However, in the second patient at five years, we are still seeing a substantial improvement in vision, which is still uh, recorded in terms of the patient's ability to read. Uh, as ever, this has involved a huge crowd of uh, scientists um, and patients um, to help us actually get to the stages in which we have been able to test these therapeutics. Um, we are still now recruiting patients in these trials uh, going forward. So thank you very much.